Hello, my name is Tom and today I'll be presenting a practical demonstration of SSH over WebSockets using the concepts described in the Google Beyond Court paper. I've used the thoughts and ideas outlined in the paper and created a proof of concept that can be easily deployed into any business to provide a unified single sign-on approach and bridge the gap between traditional server infrastructure and web-based technologies using a combination of OAuth, OpenID and SAML. But first, what is BeyondCorp? BeyondCorp is a paper written by Google about Google's direction to move away from traditional VPN-based infrastructure to move all of their services onto the public internet and provide a trust-based authentication and authorization approach to accessing all companies' resources without the need for a VPN with the ultimate goal to completely remove the traditional corporate network. For example, in a traditional infrastructure, you have employees, employee laptops, a corporate network, some servers, a VPN, and the internet. When the employees are in the office, they connect their laptops to the corporate network, and through the corporate intranet, they can connect to company resources such as file shares, code repositories, and financial documents. When out of the office, employees can use a VPN to connect through the internet back into the corporate network to continue to access resources. Google's Beyond Corp approach is the idea to completely remove the corporate network and replace it with the public internet and move each internal intranet application onto the public internet behind a unified access gateway. This access gateway will enforce authentication and authorization for all connections to all company resources using a company's single sign-on credentials, combined with web-based protocols such as SAML, OpenID and OAuth to integrate with other company and external resources. The access gateway is designed to enforce a shared policy list with fine-grained access controls to define who can access what within the company and what device. The Access Gateway uses trusted computing inspired techniques to authenticate each connection based on a trust score. This score is calculated from many different factors such as originating IP address, operating system, operating system patch level, software inventory, antivirus status, time since last connection and other varying factors to determine the ultimate trust score of the device and the user that is connecting. However, this flow does not work particularly well with traditional infrastructure tools such as SSH. This is where my demonstration of a proof of concept I've built called the SSH WebSocket Proxy. The proxy server itself is written in Golang, both the uh, client and the server side. And I'm using IBM Data Power to provide the features of the access proxy, including the single sign-on integration, OAuth, OpenID and SAML. I'm using IBM Data Power to act as the authentication and authorization steps between the initial link between the proxy and the server to use um, client certificates and OAuth access tokens. This is done just because that's what I decided to do for this example. Both the client and the server can be configured to use quite a few different authentication methods. I'm just using IBM Data Power to sort of stick everything together. Although this example could use something else, it doesn't have to use IBM Data Power, it can work entirely without IBM Data Power. Uh, so now on to the demo. So here we can see Tom has just arrived at uh, work and he's presented with the access proxy login page where he needs to type his username and password. This is because this is his first ever sign-on attempt for the day. So he'll enter his username and password, click OK and perform the login. Uh, he could also provide some form of two-factor authentication uh, if that's what the company policy suggested. So there we are, he's logged on to the access proxy and that's where he also gets provided some links to external systems such as GitHub and Webmail and then the access proxy would perform some form of a single sign-on either through SAML or OpenID to allow him access to those activities. But because he has signed on to the access proxy once, uh, which is now in the morning, he doesn't have to sign on to it at any other time because his browser will, rem will remember the session. Uh, so now we're in PuTTY and we can see the IP address uh, at the top 
192.62.66 is not on any local IP address or local network for this system nor is it publicly accessible that's because all the communication that's going to be formed by this putty session is going to go through the SSH over WebSocket uh, integration so if we go into the proxy settings of putty we can see the local proxy is set and the command is the path to the proxy binary which because it's golang has just been cross compiled for windows with the port and the address on on the screen now i have the uh, config file which states the proxy address which in this case is tonko.com and then a strange port um, the ca which will be used to authenticate the um, tls certificate presented and then a client certificate and key pair which will identify the connection as Tom's dev laptop. We also have a client access token. So now that we've opened up uh, Putty, we can see that it's giving us an error message saying that there is no active token within the config file, which was correct at the time I did this recording. So we're going to run the proxy command on the command line with the auth function. This will perform a uh, OAuth uh, authentication or oh, sorry author authorization request which will open through Firefox uh, this could also be done automatically or could be added as a shortcut on the user's desktop so that's going to pop up and it's going to go to request for permission we're saying yes do you want to allow um, do you want to allow access to the SSH proxy allow access hit continue and then this performs a callback to localhost which then the application uses and saves the access token within the config file this only needs to be done once because that access token is valid for the entire day eight hours so there we can see the token was received successfully and saved in the config file so now we're going to restart the SSH session and that's it it all works this connection has now successfully been uh, so the SSH proxy has connected to data power over TLS, has authenticated with client certificates. Data power has then read the access token, which the system has provided. And then on the back end, the SSH proxy server has received the connection and is now tunneling this SSH session through the internet over WebSockets. And now you're just connected to the server as you normally would. You can type commands or do whatever, and then you can exit. So the whole process works fairly seamlessly. And here we can see on the server side that the TLS connection from data power was verified successfully. And we have a signed JSON web token for the user that made the connection, which in this case is Tom. And then we have a line underneath noting that the connection was received. Uh, so now we're going to have a look at the data power flow. So in data power, we have the first step here for authenticating the device certificate, which is a AAA action. So then if we inspect that part of the transaction, we can see under the context variables, we can see the certificate that was presented and verified by data power, which in this case is Tom's laptop, Tom's dev laptop. Uh, and then if we look at the next bit in the flow, we have a bit of gateway script, which is slowly scraping up the details of the transaction and then saving them in a local context so they can be used to make a policy decision. So here we can see a new co context called uh, SSH auth and we can see they've saved the requested resources, which is the IP address and the device. Next, we have another uh, AAA object which is looking at the OAuth token so this is validating the OAuth token is Tom that it's valid and other bits and bobs and we can see that the extracted information from that when it loads There we are, so we can see the that's taken from the authorization token which is sent by the client and the origin is the IP address of the requested resource. And we have another gateway script here which is then scraping up that information and saving it in the local context. So if we go back to the context view, 
we can see that we now have the other information which is the user that authenticated uh, the OAuth client name and that's basically everything we need in order to make a policy decision in this case we're making the policy via uh, the gateway script action which basically just states anything that's uh, user Tom is allowed but this could be sent to a SAML server to make a um, authorization request it could be sent to your big internal policy list there's tons and tons of options then after that data power generates a signed JSON web token for the back end um, this is to give a separation between the front end interface and the back end interface so that if you somehow bypass data power you wouldn't be able to connect because you don't have a signed JSON web token and then we set a routing action to say okay now connect to that SSH uh, WebSocket proxy server which was given uh, in the request so here we look at the end result and we can see there's a JSON web token signed in the headers this big blob at the bottom and if we copy and paste that into a viewer we can see that it was a signed JSON web token for Tom issued by data power the audience is only for that SSH session and it's valid for five minutes so this would mean that that token can only be used to contact the specific server that uh, was requested so this acts as a big sort of uh, authentication and authorization stamp that this policy decision was successfully made validated and confirmed here's a signed JSON web token to prove it and this policy decision is only valid for five minutes of course this token is used practically instantly once the connection is forwarded on but that token lifetime also gives some leeway so if it takes too long to connect or something horribly goes wrong the token itself then deactivates after five minutes um, so yeah that is the demo Thank you.